By now you should have watched the web lecture on the different kinds of blood vessels and also the web lecture on the organization of circulatory systems and you should have a pretty good idea about how the circulatory system in general is laid out and the one part of what we left a little bit uh, sketchy was the region around the gills and how this was really transformed in this transition from a single circuit circulatory system to a double circuit circulatory system. So in this web lecture, we're going to focus in our microscope on that region of the circulatory system and examine the evolution of these aortic arches. So remember that the aortic arches are diagrammed here as a single vessel going from the ventral aorta coming out of the heart all the way up to the dorsal aorta. But remember that these are actually a series of vessels that are going to interact with the gills. So remember there's going to be an afferent branchial artery that's going to give rise to a collecting loop that's going to give off all of those vessels that go into the primary and secondary lamellae of the gills where they'll then be picked up on the other side of the collecting loop and feed into these efferent branchial arteries going up into the dorsal aorta. But we can think of this whole system as just a single um, aortic arch, and we have a number of them corresponding to each of the gills. And so ancestrally and also embryonically, we have six of these arches. Remember, they are going to go in between these branchial arches, these skeletal structures, and be sort of intersegmental in between them. So in nearly all living nathostomes, this first arch is lost. And so what we're going to do in this web lecture is we're going to trace the fate of each of the rest of these aortic arches in the different groups of vertebrates and see how these end up giving rise to the kind of great vessels that we see, for example, in the human heart, in the mammalian heart. So don't worry about the details in this figure, but what I want you to see is the complexity of this transformation and what we end up with in the end is very, very different from this very simple situation in sort of an ancestral vertebrate where you're going to have each of these six arches serving gills all the way down to a fully lung breathing form with very few of these branches left. And what we're going to do is trace this history and see how you get from here to here. So let's start with the setup in a fish and we're going to use the shark as an example. So we're going to go through each of these arch by arch and see what happens to them. So of course the first arch is lost as an arch, but our current hypothesis is that this little opening behind the eye called the spiracle in sharks and other elasmobranch chondrichthians um, is actually a derivative of that first pharyngeal slit. And there's a little branch coming off of the second arch that goes to the spiracle, that opening, called the spiricular artery. So it's thought, if we look at this first aortic arch, probably a derivative of that arch is the spiricular artery, although in current sharks, it's going to be a branch off of the second arch. The second arch itself is going to give rise to these anteriorly projecting vessels, the internal and external carotid. So the second arch gives rise to these carotid arteries. Remember the internal carotid um, provides blood flow to the brain. The external carotid provides blood flow to the jaws and face. And then all of the rest of these arches, three, four, five, and six, are all going to be serving gills. So here is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. They're all going to be going to gills, and this is going to be the arrangement in fish in general. We don't start to get a really big change until we go from this one circuit system to a two circuit system. And what we're going to see is that this is the basic framework for all of these changes. This is going to be our phone booth in which we're going to build this lending library by using these original aortic arch structures to create this two circuit system. So let's review the differences between this one circuit circulation and the two circuit circulation. So remember in one circuit circulation, blood is pumped from the heart to the capillary beds in the gills. 
and from there directly into the dorsal aorta, which is going to carry the blood to the systemic circuit, which is just represented as a capillary bed here. But remember, this is going all the way anterior and posterior to every single cell in the body, being collected back up in a venous system and returned to the heart in a single circuit. In a lung breathing system, what we end up with are two completely separated circuits, a pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit. Blood is gonna be pumped from the heart to the lungs into this pulmonary circuit and then returned back to the heart to be repumped. And in this way, blood is delivered to the systemic circuit, to the body circuit under high pressure. So every time blood goes through a capillary bed, there's a drop in the blood pressure within those vessels the benefit to this two circuit system is that the blood is then repumped, returned to the heart to be repumped, and this is going to restore that high pressure that was lost as the blood was transported over these capillary beds in the lungs. So there are a couple of downsides to this two circuit system, especially if you think of it being derived from the one circuit system rather than this highly derived mammalian heart that you're seeing here. Before there was all this separation, these different chambers of the heart that were separated from each other, you basically had a simple flow through system and returning the blood to the heart after it's been oxygenated runs the risk of mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So this is one challenge that needs to be overcome in these two circuit systems. And secondly, there's a challenge of preventing unnecessary blood flow to capillary beds. And we'll see this come into play in class when we look at the details of lung breathing versus gill breathing in lungfish. But basically it requires a lot of energy to pump blood through a capillary bed. When that capillary bed's not being used, we want to have mechanisms to keep the blood from flowing there. We'll see this over and over and over again, primarily in class, how there are different shunting mechanisms that are going to redirect the pathway of blood flow to make sure energy is not being used to pump blood through a capillary bed when it's not being used. So let's take a look at the simplest, most ancestral form of this two circuit system. And this is the case of a lungfish. So we're gonna start here in the heart and going uh, to the right into the ventral aorta. And let's take a look at what happens to each of these aortic arches in turn. So like in most nathostomes, the first aortic arch is completely lost. The second bears a gill, but it also gives rise to the external carotid artery from the ventral aorta and to the internal carotid artery from the dorsal aorta. So these are gonna be separate branches for the internal and external carotid. The third and fourth aortic arches have lost their gills. They're going to be direct roots from the ventral aorta straight into the dorsal aorta. The fifth and sixth aortic arches both bear gills. And so in gill breathing mode, the blood is going to be directed to these gill bearing arches. But the sixth arch has some new features. So the sixth arch has gained a branch that leads to the lung. So this is going to be the pulmonary artery, bringing blood from the heart to the lungs. But there's still this connection between this pulmonary artery and the dorsal aorta. And this part of the sixth arch that lies between the pulmonary artery and the dorsal aorta is called the ductus arteriosus. So this is a pathway between those two vessels. We also see a completely novel vessel here, the pulmonary vein, that's going to bring blood back from the lung into the heart to be repumped in this two circuit system. So all of these kind of weird patterns of flow are going to have to do with the ability to switch between gill breathing and lung breathing. And we'll look at the details of that in class. What I want you to focus in on here is just what are the derivatives of each of these arches. So now let's take a look at another vertebrate that uses both lung breathing and gill breathing. And this is the salamander larva. Let's take a look at what's happening to each of these arches. As usual, the first arch is gone, but during embryonic development, the second arch also deteriorates in these amphibians. So now we've got the carotid arches, both internal and external, branching from the third arch. The third 
fourth and fifth arches still bear gills, so we've got functional gills in arches three, four, and five. The sixth arch has become fully committed to this pulmonary circuit. So we've got the sixth arch still um, giving off a branch to the lung, the pulmonary artery, and we still have this little connector between the pulmonary artery and the dorsal aorta called the ductus arteriosus. In the adult salamander, of course, the gills are lost. In, in most of them, there are some that retain gills into adulthood, but in the ones that are lost, we lose these gills in arches three, four, and five. They become straight shots from the ventral aorta to the dorsal aorta. And what we have is a valve within the conus arteriosus, this last part of the heart, that's going to generally direct deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart toward the sixth arch to go to the lung, and it's gonna generally direct oxygenated blood coming from the left side of the heart into the ventral aorta to move through these connector vessels in the other arches to the dorsal aorta to be distributed to the body and also into these carotid arteries. In the adult frog, we've got a couple of changes. So this diagram that you're looking at is a little bit different. What the illustrator has done is kind of unfolded the heart. So this portion of the heart in life would be folded up and found anteriorly. Um, so the left and right atrium would be found up here, kind of sitting on top of the beginnings of the ventral aorta. The ventricles would be sort of posterior. But we've kind of stretched it out and unfolded it so that you can clearly see the pathway of blood through these vessels. And so let's again go through these arches one by one. So one and two are lost. Arch three continues to give rise to the carotid. But in the case of the adult frog, this little connection, this part of the dorsal aorta that used to be between arches three and four has been lost. So this structure, when it's not lost, is known as the carotid duct, and it's going to usually give rise to the internal carotid. Now what we have is a common carotid artery that is that is part of the third arch that's going to branch to give both the internal and external carotid arteries. Still internal to brain, external to jaw and face. So this portion of the ventral aorta between the third and fourth arch is now known as the common carotid artery. Arch four is always from here on out going to give rise to the dorsal aorta. In the case of amphibians, these are paired left and right. They're going to come together posterior to the heart to form the single dorsal aorta. Aortic arch 5 atrophies in, in adult frogs. It's completely lost, never to be seen again. So we've seen the end of arch 5 as with arches 1 and 2. They are evolutionarily lost at this point. Arch 6 continues to give rise to the pulmonary circuit. In the case of amphibians, Arch 6 becomes an artery called the pulmocutaneous artery. So what does that mean? The biggest branch of this goes to the lungs, but it's also going to give off a branch that's going to branch out and spread out just beneath the skin for that cutaneous respiration. So it's going to be taking in oxygen from the skin and then all of it converging back into the pulmonary veins to bring that oxygenated blood back into the heart to be repumped. So this is how we end up being able to use both lungs and skin for oxygen exchange. In the case of adult frogs, this little ductus arteriosus, this connection in the sixth arch between the pulmonary artery and the dorsal aorta closes and becomes a little ligament called the ligamentum arteriosum, but this connection as an open patent vessel is gone. Now let's take a look at a similar diagram in Lepidosaurs and turtles. So again, the heart is sort of unfolded, so you can see the blood as kind of a straight shot through this heart. And what we see in these groups is that the ventral aorta, at the point where it leaves the ventricles, which are partially separated, it's going to be divided into three parts. One part is going to be the pulmonary artery, so the derivative of arch six is going to come off farthest to the right and then split into the two branches going to the two lungs. There's going to be a left systemic arch, so this is going to be arch four, which comes out in the middle. And then the right systemic arch 
is going to come out from the very left hand side and now this is going to give rise to the carotid arteries so give rise to the common carotid so it's going to come right off of this right systemic arch arches one and two are lost as usual and arch three now is going to branch directly off of arch four the lepidosaurs and turtles retain this carotid duct this part of the dorsal aorta between arches three and four but we see this really bizarre crossing over of these arteries that seem to make little sense but this arrangement does something very very important it's basically taking blood that's coming from the right side that's the deoxygenated blood coming back from the body and making sure that it goes to the lungs to be oxygenated to the extent that the blood is mixed deoxygenated and oxygenated blood that's going to go out to the left systemic arch to the body the very most oxygenated blood is going to go into this right systemic arch that's going to be connected to the carotids to make sure that the brain gets the most oxygenated blood available. So we see a variation of this arrangement in crocodilians. In crocodilians, we have complete septation of the ventricles. So right now we're just seeing the left and right ventricle and then the great vessels leaving from them. The atria are in their normal position, up anterior and a little bit ventral. What we see is the pulmonary artery leaves from the right ventricle, as you would expect. This is where the deoxygenated blood is. And it's going to split into the two arteries going to the two lungs. We have the right systemic artery coming from the left ventricle. This is where the oxygenated blood coming from the lungs is going to be located. So that makes sense. But the left systemic artery is coming from the right ventricle where the deoxygenated blood is. Wait, what? How does this make any sense? We're going to talk about this blood pathway in more detail in class, but it has to do with this little structure called the foramen of Panisa, this little opening between the two systemic arteries that is going to allow uh, flexibility in the pathway of blood flow when crocodilians are not breathing, when they're submerged in water. And so this will make much, much more sense after we discuss it in class. But remember that there's this weird pattern of exit from the different ventricles in the crocodilian heart. The rest of the arches are the same in crocodilians as what we see in lepidosaurs and turtles. In mammals, we have the same loss of arches one, two, and five. We've got Again, a common carotid artery that's arising from arch three, an internal and external carotid artery. In mammals, that carotid duct is lost, that connection between arch three and four, that portion of the dorsal aorta. In arch four, the systemic arch, we now have just a single aorta, and it arises from the left aortic arch. The right side of it becomes the right subclavian artery. So this is going out to the right forelimb. The left subclavian artery is a branch off of the single aorta. Um, the sixth arch continues to be the pulmonary arch. This ductus arteriosus between the sixth arch and the dorsal aorta is closed and lost in adult mammals. Birds have convergently evolved a single aorta, but in the case of birds, it comes from the right systemic arch. So it's going to be the right systemic arch that's going to give rise to that systemic circuit going down into the single aorta. The subclavian arteries in birds branch off in a completely different pattern from mammals. So again, arches one and two are completely gone. Arch three gives rise to the common carotid, which gives rise to the internal and external carotid as before. But the common carotid also gives rise to the subclavian arteries going out to the wings, both on the left and the right in the case of birds. So the carotids and the subclavian arteries come from arch three. Again, arch four, the right side of the fourth arch, the systemic arch, gives rise to the single aorta. Fifth arch is lost. Sixth, as always, is the pulmonary arch, giving rise to the pulmonary arteries. And again, in birds, that connection between the pulmonary artery and the dorsal aorta is completely lost. There's absolutely no mixing possible of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the case of bird and mammal hearts because of the loss of this ductus arteriosus and 
the complete separation of vessels, a single vessel coming from the left side with the oxygenated blood, a single vessel coming from the right side with the deoxygenated blood. These circuits are kept completely separate in birds and mammals. So to begin to process all of this information and to synthesize it, what I suggest that you do is make a little chart like this one for each of the groups that I've talked about and just stating what are the derivatives of each arch, what structures do they give rise to in each group, and keeping track of the fate of this carotid duct. Remind yourself what that is, write down a definition, and the ductus arteriosus, same for each of these groups. And so we've seen it in the shark, the lungfish, a larval amphibian, and also a frog. And then we have gone on to look at the arrangement in lepidosaurs and turtles and crocodilians in mammals and in birds. So do this for each one of these groups to make sure that you've sort of put all this information together and you can trace the history of each of these arches in each one of these groups.